Welcome to Making Waves, a show about sound art, produced by New Adventures in Sound Art. Also available on NasaTube, the YouTube channel of New Adventures in Sound Art. Those are sounds of uh, people playing the sound installation Secret Reception by Christine Dykeman, Ben, ben Pajak, and Tony Allard. Secret Reception uses touch, sound, and magnified perceptual drawings to explain how insects use vibration to transmit sonic information. Here is Ben Pajak to introduce you to the installation, which will lead into my conversation with him, along with his collaborator, Christine Dykeman. But the reception is really the focus of our um, of our um, project, and that's why we call it secret reception. Because um, we found while we were digging into the literature that there's quite a bit published about how insects produce sound, but not not as much as how they receive it. We we chose insects that produce sound that we know about. Um, kind of deliberately, um, as you know, we have eight subjects and um, they're loosely grouped. Um, the first two are um, treetop coursing insects at, that aggregate. Um, then we have um, some forest uh, dwelling, leaf litter, rotten log dwelling insects. Um, and we have some hymenoptera, which are bees and wasps, um, and also um, for diversity of habitat, we chose one that's aquatic, the water boatman and uh, the mosquito. I think I've, I've hit most of them. Uh, the, to start with the first two, the chorusing insects, we're, we um, are always enchanted by hearing in the midsummer the katydids and um, cicadas. And uh, well, I know it's regionally specific, but I can speak for myself that um, those are um, part of the summer soundscape. And um, so katydids um, come in later uh, in midsummer and are nocturnal. They make their sounds and receive their sounds um, at night. And there's almost a little bit of a handoff from the daytime choristers, which are the cicadas. Now, um, there are many species of both of those, um, and there's a lot of variation. Um, I'm particularly enchanted by the um, periodical cicada, but we also have what's called the dog day uh, cicada. The periodical cicadas are the ones that um, emerge uh, at, at really long intervals, 13, 17 years. And the recording that we used specifically was from a, an emergence that occurred in our area, in my area, um, um, on a 17 year cycle. Uh, brew 10. Um, well, they, um, they are in the canopy and in large numbers. So it's not just an individual insect, it's a chorus, a chorus of insects that are, um, and they're quite loud, uh, amazingly loud uh, when they combine their voices, their voices together. Um, and the uh, intriguing thing about katydids are that they ha they hear with their knees. They they have a sensory organ in their knees um, called an acoustic trachea that picks up the sonic vibrations. Um, and um, you know, it, it if if we don't if we aren't familiar with the arthropod or insect world, um, we may assume that every everything here is the same way. And it's not true. That's what's that's what's so wonderful about discovery in the insects. Um, cicadas, on the other hand, um, receive their 
vibrations in a, a tympanic ear, which is um, on the second abdominal segment um, of their body, uh, in, caps in these encapsulated um, membranes. So um, that's also pretty cool. So I was really interested in how you characterize the mosquito and the water boatman as aquatic. Uh, I never thought of the mosquito as aquatic, but, um, but I think maybe those two are interesting too because more is known about how the mosquito hears than the water boatman hears. So maybe since we paired those, you could dive into that a little bit, so to speak. <laughs> Well, you, you aren't alone. A lot of people forget um, that that thing that is annoying them in their backyard actually originates in the water. As a matter of fact, um, that adult stage is a very ephemeral stage, um, typically. Again, it's hard to generalize because there are so many species within these groups. There are hundreds um, of species of mosquitoes. Um, and they all earn their living a different way, but they all do rely on the aquatic um, environment for their life cycle. And the mosquito, um, interestingly, it's wing beats and it's species specific. So even if you have a lot of mosquito species out there, the frequency of their wing beats are different from each other. And it, it's the, the female wing beat that the males are able to pick up to mate and they pick up that um, vibration um, with their antenna and specifically the impulses are received by the um, sensilla and the antenna and, and then travel to the um, Johnson's organ, which is a, a highly sophisticated organ in the base of their antenna and processed. And then the little mosquito um, a uh, decentralized nervous system brain starts thinking, ah, female, and, and heads to her. But why, why don't you talk about the water boatman? So I'm trying to avoid talking about the water boatman. I know that the water boatman makes sound through stridulation, right? Which is, you know, uh, like, a, like, a, um, like a tooth and a, like a scraper, right? Um, but I think the thing is what we don't know for sure is how they hear or where they hear. That's a big question about the water boatmen, right? Well, y yes and no. Um, again, there are many species of water boatmen, and you're, you're absolutely right, Christine. The, uh, the noise is produced by stridulation. It's a, a, I call it a terminal appendage on the male. Um, it, uh, it is not inappropriate to call it genitalia. And um, when a paper was published um, a few years ago, pointing out the fact that of this discovery, it got a lot of actually popular press just because of the, um, shall we call it titillation of, of, of um, noise being produced by uh, genitalia. So um, be that as it may, that's the way it is. So, you know, <laughs> if you're amused by it, then good for you. But um, in any event, uh, uh, so that terminal appendage rubs against the bottom of the abdomen, which has very um, um, noticeable, uh, if you look at it under a microscope, ridges and makes that um, scraping sound. And um, large numbers, again, in ponds will do it to the point where um, you can hear it with the, with the human ear um, as almost like a chorusing. They do swim on the surface, but they also dive. And there is one species that has been studied, and they have um, um, located the um, hearing organ. And I believe it is al also a tympanic air, but it has some modifications, um, I guess, very specific to the aquatic environment in this particular species. It has like a, a, an a, um, extension 
that um, serves a purpose of um, a reception. And, and the, the interesting thing is they have, they're paired and one is a different size than the other, which you would think symmetry would be valuable, but no. And in fact, that has some ability to, they theorize, I guess it's not proven that this is to adapt to the different um, diving, aquatic diving depths to be able to, um, to um, process um, sound um, in, in, a, in a way that they need to do it. Um, so that's pretty intriguing. Um, but, you know, the thing I think Christine um, touched on, um, it, you know, she said um, more than human, um, and that's the key to what we are trying to do. I mean, it's, it's interesting just to hear these sounds, but we're not insects. So we don't really know how they're receiving it. We can look at their, their morphology and, and their physiology um, and their taxonomy, but in, in reality, what are they really feeling? And so that's what we wanted to touch on uh, with the vibrations. And um, that's why it, we designed it to have purposely high energy vibrating um, boxes so that it's not just cute to hear these sounds, but also to, to feel them and maybe, maybe get a little bit of a sense of what the receiving insects are feeling. Yeah, thank you. That, I'm glad you brought that around. And the other thing that I noticed, and because we don't know what the insects feel, right? We don't know what their perception is. We don't know what their experience is. But I know for the human visitor, um, they feel a lot of delight and joy, and I think you can see that when they when they get to feel the vibration. Usually, their people are are um, delighted by it, uh, which I really like. That there's this transformation that that the human visitor has in experiencing this other sense. But is that in order to get that feeling? Is it dependent on hearing low frequencies, or is it uh, is there a range of frequencies that where that's possible? Excellent question. Um, you're right. The feeling um, that we can sense are the, are the lower frequencies, the more vivid. And so certainly if you get into the higher frequencies, we won't have that energy that we're able to actually feel. Um, that's why the majority of the insects, I would think, or a good proportion of them are ones that are audible normally and have high energy and that you, you can feel. But there are a few of our, our subjects that, including a, a microscopic wasp, a parasitic wasp, which you can barely see with the naked eye. It's like um, a pepper grain um, makes a sound. But I mean, just it's, it's obvious the sound that this thing would make is not something that we could hear. And it would, it would have to be high frequency because the length of the wings, which are making the vibrations are so short. So uh, we used a sound file um, where the that was pitched down, down into our audible um, uh, area, and also down enough where it, did it does generate enough vibration. For but does that wasp being up higher, is it higher than other wasps and bees that that puts it on a different channel of communication amongst its own species. Well, you know, there's a whole hidden world of little tiny wasps and flies that earn their living parasitizing other insects. So, and again, hundreds, thousands of species that when you say the word wasp, everybody thinks about the thing that's making the paper nest up in their eaves and, and uh, stinging you. But, they are only one, the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the wasp iceberg, the big ones that we all know about, but there is this whole ecosystem of parasitism and commensalism and mutualism and, and, and they're all microscopic. And I would say this one example we picked, the only reason we have this sound file is because it has um, the potential for be a, being a biocontrol agent because it lays its eggs 
in the larva of the Mediterranean fruit fly. And since the Mediterranean fruit, fruit fly is a pest, it would be nice to have something naturally, not a pesticide, that might control it. So there has been um, research done on that, and that's why um, we have a sound file. Now, that's one of the, the few that we didn't record ourselves, but we, we sourced it from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, um, which was um, one of the researchers who was studying it to see how maybe they could encourage this wasp to uh, proliferate and do some good things um, in, in the ecosystem. So. Different species of insects seem to us a fairly repetitive sound. Is it a case that to discern what's their what they're interested in and what they're not is has a certain rhythmic pattern? I, I think in this particular case I would be surprised if the rhythm didn't play a role because it's such an intriguing sound. If you if you heard it, there is um, a different definite cadence to it. And it doesn't seem to be random. It seems to have um, um, maybe not a predictable pattern, but there is some kind of pattern. So I, I would say I'm sure um, that, that that may have some role. But the other thing that's interesting yeah. about that uh, insect is that not only you know hears or understands the world through the antenna, but the female is the one course, that lays the eggs. And she... Um, taps with her front legs um, or maybe all the legs I'm not certain and to listen to to detect um, in the substrate whether there's uh, organisms there that she can lay her eggs in and so she'll go like this and and determine whether it's a denser or less dense material in the substrate so that's also very interesting too that you know, she's using that also to sense uh, vibration in a different way that isn't part of the um, vibration that goes through, you know, particle matter like air. And are these, uh, all these insects or some of them, are they using anything similar to sight? Or is it all tactile and auditory? And smell, perhaps? Um, I'm going down the list of the eight. All of the eight that we've used have eyes um, of some sort. I think it may vary by tax of which ones have the vision is more or less important in their daily lives, um, but they all do have um, a visual component. When we experience it as visitors, we see this table, we see the drawings, we're, we see a visual representation that's, that's very large. Uh, I guess we're projecting our visual experience onto their experience. And I wondered if there wasn't any visual, if it was, if it was in a dark room with just the objects moving around, whether we, our engagement with the auditory would be different. Well, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, because actually our, our third collaborator, Tony Allard, um, was the one who explored um, the, the, the size of the insects that, that he drew were purposely large. And I think that, again, was his attempt to try to bring us into the world, um, um, you know, even visually and physically to be part of, to be, to, to get the feeling, not only as, as we mentioned the vibrations, but also to be kind of among them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for us to, to reduce us down to their size. Yes. Okay. He had a very strong um, 
feeling about the size and I think dependent on how it gets shown in the future, he, had, he wanted them life size so that we could really make this, um, you know, direct kind of um, physical experience with the insect. So it's not something um, mystic, you know, sort of mysterious or cryptic or hidden because we talk about the sounds, you know, when we write about it um, as these cryptic or hidden sounds. But, there, but, but we want to uncover that. We want to yeah. make that available to the visitor. So I think in the same way that we want to do that with the, with the haptic and the, our ability to hear them, that he wanted to do that visually. So I think that those things conceptually work together. Mm -hmm. uh, just on a different uh, train of thought, um, I was interested, I mean, you're a scientist and... Uh, but you're also involved in a lot of creative music uh, activities, and uh, does this project for you bring those two together and, uh, in a way that maybe you didn't imagine when you're pursuing these separate worlds in the past? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I got all kinds of um, inspiration. Um, um, you're right. I'm. Um, I have an interest in music and do do some. Um, um, composing, um, but my collaboration with Christine really got me thinking um, about potential, the the potential, and and how throughout our producing this this um, piece, everything sounded musical to me. Any sound that came out of uh, what we discovered, and we we were this was a this was a project of discovery for both of us, um, and Christine really helped me a lot because coming more from the scientific world, um, you think a certain way, and I am increasingly realizing that they both art and science is very compatible, and there aren't any kind that you're not. You're not making any mistakes, or you're not um, stepping on on anyone's toes, or you're not um, defying the scientific process by incorporating art into it. And I think also, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is balance the informational, educational, scientific, and art experience that. It's, it is an artwork, um, but it's also a little bit educational. It's a little bit of a game. It um, definitely includes, you know, we're trying to be scientifically accurate. But the entry in, we hope, for the visitor is through the artwork itself. And then to start asking these questions that, you know, we've been talking about. I can't help thinking about a, um, a professor um, in that I actually didn't have, but he had a reputation um, in, in the entomology department that I studied in, um, Dr. Jones, and he um, was known as a very hard taskmaster, master, and he, he taught insect um, physiology and morphology, mainly morphology. And morphology is just looking very closely at all the components of, of an organism. And he made his students draw. And this was not an art, this was scientific drawing and, and none, of, none of them. And I know this from having friends who were taking his course that um, they somewhat complained about how hard it was because they weren't artists, but they had to meticulously draw every little organ and hair and pore and and um, leg and facets of the eyes and, and the gut and the um, nervous system and, and draw it. And um, I, at that time, I thought, whew, I'm glad I'm not taking that course. But now, I mean, this is, this is what we're doing, not only the visual component, but we're looking at the morphology of these organisms. And there's it's just so mind-boggling how they do what they do. 
So I'm not sure I answered the question, but I will say the convention of studying structure and and trying to determine what how structure relates to behavior, and in our case, in a behavior that includes sound, um, is something that really is is deeply profound um, that I have discovered with this project. That when you're doing perceptual drawing, it teaches you something about the object that you're drawing that you normally wouldn't notice. And so I know when I'm doing perceptual drawing, I'm, I'm always, you know, that's like drawing from something in life that's accurate. <clears throat> I'm, when I'm drawing, I'm really concentrating on what I'm seeing, and I see things that I've never seen before. And I know when Tony was drawing, because I was in the studio soldering components while he was drawing, um, he kept saying, oh, wow, it has this amazing, like, leg on it. Oh, it has, you know, segments in the leg. And so for him, he was, like, visually you know, exploring and experiencing these insects on this scale that was, that brought him, him as an artist, closer to it. So I think also listening to them, you know, listening to the recordings, um, preparing the recordings of the piece. And, and even today, when I had, t I had time alone with the piece today, Ben, I, you know, we set it up and then it's like, we're mobbed and we take it down or we're done, right? And today I had a good deal of time alone with it. And I really could touch it and listen to it and get into the rhythms and explore it. And it was probably the first time that I really clearly listened to the sound as it is um, represented in the installation. So I got another, you know, insight into that part um, through, you know, I guess deep listening, you know, deep looking, deep listening. Improvising. Yeah, Improvising. yeah exactly. <laughs> um. Do you find that in your experience in the artistic world that there's things missing in it, that if there was more uh, information and knowledge about the uh, science, scientific world, I don't know if you call it that, but the, the natural world, uh, that, uh, uh, that would maybe better inform artistic practice or, or uh, give it more depth? I think I understand your question, and actually, it's the opposite. I am I am coming to terms with the fact that um, I I am okay in the spaces that art provides that aren't filled with maybe a little bit more um, uh, content um, that that um, invite you to. To fill in the blanks, um, that's that's the um, adventure I'm going through now. Um, to uh, to be okay with it, to be okay with filling in the blanks, and I think that is what stimulates imagination and 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 creativity. So, <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because I agree with you, and I I remember when I was when we were trying to figure out the organs of sound reception and we were learning about it and researching it together and um, I would find something you know that I would read in a picture and I'd run it by you and I, and I remember you saying well yeah maybe I don't know but it is interpretation I mean we're not trying to do something inaccurate but the thing about you know taking data let's just say scientific data and doing data sonification or data visualization is that the artist or the designer has to use a great deal of interpretation um, to draw something or create something that the general public can then in, um, enter into. So that was, I really enjoyed the freedom to make the drawings of those organs. Um, I mean, they're accurate to what I understood them to be, but I also knew that they were uh, an essential part of the artwork that needed to draw people in and and pique their curiosity to want to explore them. Um, and then on the other hand, maybe because I was so intrigued by the content that was so new to me, I was striving the whole time to be scientifically accurate in my thinking about it. 
And I would just, I constantly run things by Ben, like, is this right? Is this true? Is this, is this, is this that? And because I just really, I had this strong sense of needing to know what was accurate. Although it may not be represented in the artwork completely in the end, it really drove me in the piece to make certain that I was understanding this complex, complex world of insects that I had to just really kind of narrow down to this artwork and to these eight insects that we were dealing with. But it was, it was an incredible, it opened up a whole world to me that I, I was really inspired by. Can I, can I tell a real quick story? In, in the beginning of our, of our um, concept, conceiving this, um, Christine and Tony were like um, making images and, and there was this, um, they were excited to share this really big image in, uh, with me on a Zoom. And they said, look, uh, what do you think of this mosquito? And I said, it, it's lovely, but it's, it's not a mosquito, it's a midge. And, um, and, you know, I mean, that's not the first time that's happened. I mean, it, it, oftentimes when someone says, I had the biggest mosquito, and it, it probably wasn't a mosquito, it was, it was a midge. Um, and they're very, it's like the difference between a, a German Shepherd and a, uh, <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I'm going to get myself in trouble in here with, but, um, and, and, Nah, uh, I would say they're yeah okay. They're they're both diptera. They're both flies. So we'll keep them in the in the in the mammal world. I'd say difference between a cow and a German shepherd. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I thought, wow, this is such an awesome mosquito. <laughs> yeah. So so the next time we're uh, uh, that we see insects in our garden or uh, when we're out in the forest or. I mean, is there, what is our impact on them uh, when we stomp through the gar forest or we're digging in the garden and, and uh, what, what role do we play in their lives? Wow. Um, that's, I think that's, that's the ultimate question. Um, uh, We, we certainly are part of their worlds. And um, in many ways, we have altered their worlds beyond our, our, our ability to even, um, you know, absorb, um, you know, on the, on the small scale, you know, in a garden, we, we are constantly manipulating and changing the environment that insects live in. We try to do it to our advantage so that they don't eat our tomatoes and, and um, they don't um, bite us like, um, you know, eliminating standing water. But, you know, we, we, we intervene in our behalf, but I'm sure we also intervene on a grander scale um to nobody's benefit um and that's one of the other things where this project i'm hoping will create some awareness of what you know what kind of impact are we having um so and i think it's you know the impacts that we talked about is anthropogenic noise for one mm -hmm. you know and we've talked about that in the piece we weren't able to to, to bring that out. It was one of our goals was to talk about the impact of noise, you know, with insects, that, especially in substrates, that that noise will affect their ability to communicate. Um, but also, you know, the, the very common practice that I see here even, and by the way, Ben, there's a lot of mosquitoes here, just saying. <laughs> there's a lot of mosquitoes here. Um, as I'm seeing these signs for, you know, um, poison pest control of mosquitoes, they're all over. And, you know, that is going to have obviously, you know, reverberating impacts on other, uh, on other animals. One of the visitors who came in today, who oh, I mentioned in a text to Ben, was a woman whose garden, she has an organic garden, uh, Jody, and she talked about using integrated pest management 
and she was explaining some of the things that she did. That there's mites that she uh, sends away for, and the mites, she puts them in like a little pepper shaker, basically shakes them onto the ground, onto her garden, and then they go after these funguses that kill her plants. So she gets, she said she gets many, many of these things that she has to send away for. Um, and she also said that she's unable to uh, propagate them herself because the companies that control the distribution of these, you know, uh, pests, parasitic pests, don't really want people, you know, to be able to do their own, and so that's is their business model. But I thought that was really interesting that she honed in on that today and was quite um, excited about insects. And the other thing she talked about too was when she touched the beetle, She remember she was like, oh, I know that sound. They chirp and they squeak and I hear them all the time and they're in the logs. And, you know, of course I wanted to run out there and record all of her beetles, but she was quite familiar with the sound. And just having somebody like that from the public come to the exhibition and be really enthusiastic about the role of insects in, in her life as an organic gardener. Um, and as somebody, it sounds like she makes things out of wood, so she wants to be able to control things to a certain extent. It was really exciting for me that that, that, that it's, it's not somebody who's necessarily just coming to, to experience art or audio art, but coming to be in your space and be part of the community and then offer all this information back to me. It was, it was really great. The question came up today in the, in the people that visited, was, and, or maybe it was a question I had myself, uh, is where the different insects uh, live in the world that are in the piece? Um, are they all from uh, North America, the US, uh, your neighborhood, or, you know, uh, or, you know, or on many continents? I didn't know. Okay, um, the cicada and the katydids are um, North American. Uh, there are probably corresponding different species in other parts of the country, but the ones specifically that we have sound files for were recorded in the mid-Atlantic uh, US. The uh, parasitic wasp, um, since it's a USDA sound file, um, I'm not sure where it's native to, and oftentimes when they look at um, something that might be a biocontrol agent, they have to go to the source of the origin of the pest that they're trying to um, control. So I'm going to defer on, on that one. Uh, the horn pasalis, again, mid-Atlantic U.S., but I think they're, they're on um, other parts of the United States. Uh, the Madagascar hissing cockroach, Madagascar, um, native. Um, the I think it was 80 solicitans, that particular species I got a recording of. That came from Maine, but that mosquito was found throughout um, many of the um, U.S., um, at least the eastern states. Uh, water boatman, um, that was recorded in New York in a freshwater pond. We... Um, got permission from David Rothman mm -hmm. for that recording. Mm -hmm. oh, Rothenberg, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, and what have I left out? Oh, the bumblebee? That was in was Christine's in backyard. Was in like Wisconsin, yeah. Wisconsin, okay. Ah, okay. Um, did I leave anything out? I think that's, I think that's yeah. Good. So there, so because there's so many species in each one of these, correct? Is that yes. why you that correctly? It could be across all of North America. Correct, and and that's me being literal. I'm I'm wanting to make sure I'm not saying that a species is is um, in a place that it isn't. But I think we also wanted to make it a point that um, these that we selected actually are um, ambassadors for many other species within their group. So even though they may be found in a certain place. They, I'm sure they have relatives that are in other parts of the country because they're so diverse. Um, another question that comes up to Canadians, in particular and Northern Canadians, is uh, how do these uh, small uh, creatures survive the winter? And uh, you know, the winter here is uh, longer, and 
uh, and than it is in, the, in many parts of the U.S. And, and uh, what are some of their, uh, 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 you know, uh, adaptations that they, that they make? Um, I'll preface everything, every insect um, question with, it depends on the species, but some of the strategies are uh, some overwinter um, as eggs, because eggs are protective. And um, so some species do that. Some, um, some species uh, and even it varies within, for example, mosquitoes, there are certain species that actually will overwinter as larvae. And you think, well, they're very vulnerable, but they, um, one in particular, Culicea melanera, it actually overwinters as, as larvae in tree crypts. So you have a tree that falls in a, in a freshwater bog or swamp, and the roots pop up, and there's this, there's this nice little protected um, crypt. That's what they call it. And the larvae will go through the entire win winter that way and because the water uh, at a certain level won't freeze. So there are many adaptations. I think the horned pasalis um, may overwinter because logs are kind of insulated um, deep inside the logs, um, at, maybe in all life stages. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I don't think they just go to egg and then emerge at the other end. Um, uh, those are just some that come to mind. That was Christine Dykman and Ben Pajak discussing the sound making and sound reception of insects, which are featured in the interactive installation Secret Reception, is on exhibit at the NASA North Media Arts Center in South River. Speaking of insects, uh, in the wintertime uh, back in 2008, NASA had a piece on its Deep Wireless 3 album called Creatures of the Ice. This piece by Montreal sound artist Eldad Zabri consisted of a single recording of a colony of ants living in a frozen waterway in Nunavut, Canada.
That was Creatures of the Ice by Eldad Zabari. In addition to being on the Deep Wireless 3 album, uh, you can also find it at sonus.ca, which is the online collection of electroacoustic music hosted by the Canadian Electroacoustic Community. Also currently on exhibit at Mesa is the outdoor sound installation Sensation of Distribution by Mitchell Akayama and Brady Peters. This piece continues a long interest among sound artists from around the world in exploring the pitched resonance of industrial plumbing tubes. However, their particular take on it extends to the architectural realm and comments on building design in the urban environment. This interview was recorded outdoors on a busy highway, which is the site where the piece is experienced. So Brady and I were artists in residence at the Bentway in Toronto uh, a few years ago, and it was a research residency, so most of what we were doing or expected to do was just sort of spend time on site and think about the sonic environment of the Bentway. And then one day one of us uh, put our ear up to the, the, these big drainage uh, pipes that come, so for those of you who don't know the site, uh, the Bentway is uh, a public space that's underneath this elevated expressway in downtown Toronto, right by the waterfront. Uh, and so the, the, when it rains, the water collects on the overpass and then gets channeled into these big pipes that drain it down to the ground below. They, they make this incredible sound, you put your ear up to it. Um, this passive resonance, like so unamplified sound, that, that, and uh, the pipes kind of change the sonic environment by um, basically like tuning um, all the sounds that are happening around you. Um, and so the, the idea that kind of germinated from that was that if we could make these pieces that kind of prompted people to listen um, to the site through these resonant tubes that are very, very musical and very pleasant to listen to, then they might start to, ex to mistake the actual infrastructure of the Bentway for artworks themselves and then vice versa. Um, so. The, the piece that I think succeeded the best in that was, uh, it was kind of the keystone, it was the piece that if you experienced that, then there's kind of no doubt that this was an artwork. Um, and so we had these five pipes that were cut to different lengths. So the, the pitch of a pipe is uh, a function of how long it is. So we calculated what the notes would be in the length for uh, these five pipes, to the first five notes of this Bach uh, organ piece, which is kind of a, an Easter egg riff on, on, on that because, um, you know, pipes and pipe organs, so it's using the same principles for resonance, but also Bach was kind of mischievous and would encode uh, Bible verses and stuff in his music, and so we thought it'd be funny to encode Bach into the pipes. So, yeah, so this guy approached this uh, person working at the site and said, when you put your ear up to the, these sculptures, they play music, and she said, well, yeah, that there's sculptures made by these artists, there's another one over there, and he looked over and saw the other one and said, but that's the plumbing. So he was confused about what was art and what was infrastructure. Um, and then even the director of the Bentway, um, she asked me one day about this one that we, I put out, this little, little guy, and she's like, oh, I like the new one, the little guy, and I was like, yeah, that's attached to a bigger one, and she said, but I thought that was the plumbing. So even the director of the site was starting to get confused about what was art and what wasn't. And uh, the, I guess the spirit behind that gesture is it, it's such a big um, monumental site that any kind of intervention that would compete with the scale of it, like sonically or visually or whatever, would just be, it would have to be enormous and expensive. And so we thought if we can rechannel some of the things that people are activating when they're engaged in interacting with art, like curiosity and you know, openness to new experiences, that maybe we could have the, the, these pipes sort of, uh, a, like first of all, transform their, their relationship to the plumbing, and then maybe have them going around asking, like, well, well, what else is art? If the plumbing is art, then maybe the garbage cans are art. Maybe the boardwalk under my feet is art, so. So the white PVC pipe is conventionally used to vent furnaces. So you'll see it on lots and lots of homes in Ontario. Um, any home that's heated with a gas furnace, the, the moisture that it generates gets uh, expelled through those vents. So we installed 
this one here, which looks kind of like a functional furnace pipe, um, but it's, it's not, it's just buried in the ground. Um, and so in the way that the, the Bach pipes were supposed to generate this understanding that there's this musical event um, and that, that would then get transposed to all the other pipes, what's happening here is visually we're counting on this pipe to read as a, as a functional furnace vent, which then makes this one next to it into a very strange kind of thing because it's, it's clearly not a practical plumbing solution, which then makes this turn into something else. So, um, yeah, we, we most of the th sort of conceptual thought and effort in this piece went into um, figuring out how to not have it be like an incidental piece because um, like one thing I talk a lot about for my work is that um, it, it, it's generally very, very site-specific, and so in the art world we often talk about the white cube. So the white cube is um, a kind of architecture for a gallery, uh, you know, white walls, hardwood floors, and the, historically and ideologically the, the function of the white cube is to be neutral. So you make a sculpture and put it in a white cube, and whether that white cube is in Tokyo or South River or Toronto or wherever, it doesn't really matter. Context is, is not important. Um, and I feel like when you're not taking stock of context, you're leaving out so much of what can power a work, like the site, the architecture, everything about the context is part of the work. We're just kind of trained to, to ignore most of what's going on in, in our work, potentially. Yeah, so what happens is when you put your ears up to the pipes, uh, these ones, I think, probably work the best uh, sonically. Um, and you, you hear, so they're, they're tuned, I think it's a sharp ones in the G. Um, and so when you listen to one on either side, you get this minor second interval. Uh, and everything that's happening sonically in the area gets filtered through. vibrating mm -hmm. always 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 like so there's there's no resonance right now because there's no um, accumulation of energy so inside a pipe the air in the pipe is always oscillating and so you, you because of the geometry because of how this sound the, the standing waves are, are reinforced that's why you get this drone so it doesn't it doesn't need any activation like any if you uh, there, there's certain like, like if it's too short, then you won't hear much. Um, so the shorter the, the, the shorter the length, the higher the pitch. If it's too long, then you the, the waveform is the wave is too low and long for you to hear. So there's a kind of a sweet spot where um, it, you hear it. We're not trying to make a musical instrument exactly, and we're not only trying to make the sonic intervention here. Um, 
So the, on the other side, there's a, a piece that is three kind of like periscope type that come out of the ground, and it'll pretty clearly read, I think, to most people as uh, you see these, these in children's playgrounds a lot, like um, sort of periscope pipes that go down into the ground and come back up, and you talk into them. Um, what's cool about these ones is that they pick up some of the resonance of the pipe, uh, but they don't really make much sound until you activate them. Um, so, like, that's another situation where we're kind of counting on the way that people read it as a genre of object to understand how they use it. So people, I think most people will go up to that and start you know, speaking into it, making noise, and they're like, oh, this pipe sounds really interesting when I yell into it or when I put my ear up to it. So maybe I'll go around and put my ear up to all of them. And then they you'll notice that all the pipes have these ear stickers on them, kind of a quiet little nudge to put your ear up to them. That was Mitchell Akiyama and Brady Peters discussing at a busy time on a rural highway the outdoor sound installation Sensation of Distribution. This has been Making Waves. Join us one month from now on WGXC Wave Farm and on the YouTube channel of New Adventures in Sound Art, NASA Tube.